Hello, our church family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so thankful that you're here. Before we jump into today's series, I just want to say that our church is a non-denominational church that meets in Madison, Wisconsin. And if you are in southern Wisconsin area, we would love for you to be a part in person. Come join us. If you are outside the Madison area, too far out there, please continue to join us online. I love that you have faithfully been with us. If this is your first time, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We want to get God's Word on the inside of you, which is the greatest seed on the face of the earth. And it is able to be planted in your heart and bring forth such fruit that it changes your life forever. God will put His super on your natural, and you will be, not might be, will be a mighty force for the Lord. All right, we are continuing our series called Created to Be, and we're ending it today with the title Bill Day. Now let's turn to Genesis 1, 26. This is where I get all of this from. And I just want to remind you the difference between religion and relationship. Religion focuses on the doing, and relationship focuses on the being. In religion, we always focus on what we must do, what we have to do. And in relationship we're, with God, we're focused on who He has created us to be. And we are more in to just being. An apple tree does not produce apples to prove it's an apple tree. As Christians, me and you, do not focus on doing good works to prove that we are a Christian. We do good works because we are a Christian. An apple tree produces apples because it is an apple tree. It's just a part of being what it was created to be. As we give our life to Christ, die to self and live for Christ, as we live for Christ, we become more like we're supposed to be, how He has created us to be every day, every year. We should be closer and more like Christ than ever before. Let's look at Genesis 1 and verse 26. And Jesus said, let us make man. That's where we got the title, believing. In our image, belonging. After our likeness, becoming. And let them have dominion, where we get today's title, building, over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the thing, all the earth, and over every creepy thing, our creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. My first point this morning, whether whatever time you're watching by, is God is a builder. God is a builder. That's who he is. It's a part of his nature. When you look around at the earth and all its glory, God built it. Have you ever spent time looking at a sunset or you know, maybe even scuba diving? I've been able to go under the water and dive down and see all the beautiful colors and in, in, uh, the fish uh, of the coral reefs. But when that sun hits the uh, atmosphere just right and you get all the colors, the reds and the pinks and, and the blues and the oranges and yellows streaking out through the sky, it is just glorious and it is because our Father, the Builder. And at this point right now, we are in fall, at least in Wisconsin at this point, and we are in the peak of the color seasons. And I never get tired, a Florida boy, being from the South, he never saw the change in colors of the seasons. It went from green to brown, and that's all we had, to being up here and seeing the beautiful reds the absolutely gorgeous oranges and, and the beauty of the yellow in the leaves, all just there. It is absolutely stunning, and it is because there was an architect, there was a builder behind it all. And according to science, he's not done building. The, it, the science would tell us that the uh, universe is continuing to expand. Band. God is continuing to build. Let's look at Genesis 2, and we're going to start in verse 7. It states, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. All right, so the word form there is the word Yahshahar. 
or more roll your R a little more. This is a southerner pronouncing uh, Greek or excuse me Hebrew, and it means to form, to fashion, to frame. That is through the idea of squeezing into shape. Now the theologians, when I first read that, they give examples of clay. My first uh, statement came from like Plato. That's that's where I first uh, uh, that's where my first idea came from. Uh, but I can also see clay, right? Now let's jump to verse 22, and I want you to see the word here. In, in verse 7, it said God formed man. Now we're going to see him with woman, and let's read what it says here. And verse 22, and the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now it's very interesting. When he made man, he formed him, like squeezing. And when he uh, made woman, he, uh, which is the word it made there, is the word bana in the Hebrew, and it means to be built. So he, he formed man by squeezing, and he built, or he made woman. Uh, and so, you know, what does that mean 100%? I'm pointing this out. So what does it mean? 100%? I, I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure, right? I don't know. But in my mind, and this is just me, I could be wrong in this, but he, he formed, squeezed man together, he formed him, uh, but when he made woman, he built her. My personal opinion, don't, it doesn't mean that I'm right on this, I, it just seems to me that he took more time and was more careful with woman when he made her. Now, I don't know, I can't say for sure, but in my mind, that's the way it kind of comes across. But whenever he made something, and I want you to see this, and we're going to read this in other places, he was, one, very purposed in why he made what he made and how he made it. And I don't know if you've ever studied how God makes things. Uh, and we're going to look at some of the scriptures of how he made things. But when he made things, he would speak to the thing he wanted it to come from. To whatever he wanted it to come from, he would make it by speaking. Now, this, this is very important. Let's turn to Genesis 1 and 11. He would speak to what he wanted it made from, and whatever he made it from, that would sustain it. And then when what he made ceased to be in existence, it would return to what it was made from. I'm, I'm going, it's going to be more clear. I promise you that. It'll be more clear as we go. Let's look at Genesis 11, excuse me, 1 and verse 11. Uh, and he said, Let the earth bring forth grass, let the herb uh, yielding seed, the fruit of tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seeds is itself upon the earth, and it was so. But what did God speak to? For all the earth, all the grass, God basically spoke to the earth and said to the earth to bring forth grass, plants, trees, and even think of the things you love, carrots. That's, that's absolutely one of my favorite. Corn, um, teas. I love tea. Uh, all these things, uh, uh, cherries, pears, apples, all this, he spoke to the ground and said, bring this forth. Now, notice that the earth sustains the grass, the trees, the herbs. It gets everything it needs from the earth, what God spoke to. It sustains it. It causes it to thrive and live and do well. And then when that tree starts to decompose, or those plants decompose, what do they go back to? Earth. So, God spoke to the earth to bring forth these things, and out of these things, the earth keeps them healthy. And then when they decompose, they return back to earth. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a point here very soon. Let's look at verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after his kind, cattle, and creepy things, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. What did he speak to? He spoke to the earth. Animals come from the dirt. 
They are stained by the dirt and they go back to the dirt. When an animal dies, it eventually rots, decomposes, and will go back to earth dirt. Now, mulch. I, when I, I have trees in my yard, not many. Uh, also, I have some plants in the yard, and I put mulch all the way around them, around my trees, around my plants. I got mulch, and for many, many reasons. One, it holds in moisture, it helps the plants, all this kind of stuff. But every so many years, I have to put more mulch down. Why? Well, what is, what is, what is my mulch? My mulch is made wood, shredded wood, uh, and wood chips and wood shred, being shredded. So what does wood come from? Uh, this is not a trick question. I'm not trying to be deep or crazy here. It comes from a tree. God spoke to the earth to bring forth trees. The earth sustains the trees. And the reason I have to add more mulch is because eventually that wood breaks down, decomposes, and goes back to earth. Why am I stressing about animals and plants all made from the earth and returned to the earth? Because I got a good point that maybe, maybe, just maybe, you've never thought about. What I want us to look at is what or who did God speak to when he wanted to make mankind? <laughs> this is where... Personally, for me, it gets super exciting. Let's look at back at Genesis 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us, speaking to the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I want you to see that when God wanted to make man, he spoke not to the earth. <laughs> well, we'll get into it. Not to the earth, but he spoke to God the Father, spoke to God the Son, and God the Father spoke to God the Holy Spirit. Why is this so important? God formed a body out of the dirt. But what did he do to bring life into that body? The Bible says he Breathed into it. I'd like to put this out there for your thought. That mankind is created from God, is sustained by God, and will return to God. Now, I know many of you probably are having the thought, well, I thought we were made from dirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This flesh was made from dirt, but that is not who you are. Who you truly are is a spirit. And your spirit to be created came out of God, just like animals and the plants came out of this earth. And our spirit is sustained by God. And when it goes, when this flesh dies, it will return, our spirit will return to God. And to me, that is exciting, that is amazing, and I am blessed to know this right here, this flesh, as good looking as it is, <laughs> one day will we'll expire. But my spirit, that is who I am. And it will live forever. And it was created by God. It is sustained by God. And it will return. Me, myself, I will return to the Lord. <laughs> that ought to make somebody shout this morning. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Remember, God is a builder. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And, ye, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Now, I want to read this out of the Amplified. It says, And you, he made alive when you were spiritually dead, and he separated, or, and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins. Not only were you the spirit created by God, he has recreated, brought back, to life, your spirit. Because we can even go back to the um, Adam and Eve. 
He said, if you eat of this tree, you shall die. Now, physically, they didn't die. Their flesh did not die when they ate of the tree. But spiritually, they were separated from the Lord. They died spiritually. And now, let's look at this. Before we came to Christ, before we accepted Jesus as our Savior, spiritually, we were dead. Our spirits were dead. But He has recreated, brought life back to our spirits. Let's look. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Number one, God is a builder. Number two, God is building his house. Now, we are dwelling places of the Lord. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. 1 Corinthians 3 and 9 says, Ye are God's building. Let's turn to 1 Peter. I've, I'm telling you, I feel like all I do is get up here and just read a bunch of scriptures to you. It's not a bad thing, but it's just like I feel like I have so many scriptures to get through. Hopefully, time-wise, we'll make it. But 1 Peter 2 and 5 says, Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. You are a spiritual house. Why don't you say this out loud? I am God's building. Say this out loud. I am a spiritual house. Ephesians 2 and 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers uh, and foreigners, but fellow set, uh, citizens, citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And ye are built, I want you to notice how many times it says built, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus himself also the corner chief, uh, excuse me, the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up a, an, unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. You are a building of the Holy Spirit. You are a building of God. God dwells on the inside of you. The more people that come to Christ, the more God's kingdom is built on this earth. So, I'd like to ask this question for your thought process. If we are God's building, then why are we building church buildings? If I am God's building, then why do we have this building that we're in today? I think that is a very valid question. That is, a, a, if, to, the, to the average mind, if you hear that you are the building of God, then why do we build temples? Why do we build churches for God? Again, I think it's a very valid question. Let's turn to he Hebrews 10 and verse 25. We see in the New and the Old Testament, uh, the people of God building buildings as the house of God. I'm the house of God, then why do we build other buildings for the house of God? Let's look. Hebrews 10 and verse 25. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together. Uh, I forgot what translation this is. I'm sorry. I'll put it on the screen. Uh, this is not the time to pull away, neglect meeting together as some has formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as anticipating that day draw away. What does this say? The closer we come to the second coming of Jesus Christ, Christians need to gather together in church buildings, in the house of God. I am a house of God coming together with other houses of God in the house of God. <laughs> <laughs> it almost goes back to the scripture. There, you know, Jesus says, There are many mansions or rooms in my Father's house. I go to prepare for you. So we will be in the house of God. We are the house of God, and we will be in the house of God. And God tells us that we need to continue to gather together, especially in the latter days. Oh my goodness. Uh, the reason we have this building, the reason why we have the website, the reason why we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, all of this where we put videos up, the whole reason my sermon's online, 
The whole reason we gather together online is to be able to reach more people. All of this, this building that I'm in, the church building I'm in today, the house of God that I am in today, the only reason we have it is it is a tool to reach more people. That's the only reason we use this as a way to, one, come together, forsake not the assemblies of our together, especially in the latter days, and two, to reach more people, to build each other up, to do the work of the Lord. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee. This is speaking of the tabernacle. That's God speaking. I will meet and commune with you in the tabernacle. Ah, now, Genesis 26 and verse 16. This is where Jacob had an experience with the Lord. And Jacob awakened out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and he said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and it is the gate of heaven. When he says it's the house of God there, he actually, the Hebrew word is Bethel. This is, and that's what Bethel means, the house of God. And there are churches named Bethel out of this same place. What made it the house of God? God was there. That's what made the place the house of God. That's what makes you the house of God is God is there. And that's what makes this building the house of God. When we come together, the Bible tells us where two or three gather together in His name. He is in the midst of them. He inhabits the praises of His people. The reason why this church building is the house of God is because we have set aside this place to come together, made this place holy, sanctified this place to be used for the kingdom of God and what makes this building of wood and sheetrock and carpet and chairs, what makes this place the house of God is that we have sanctified it to be a place where we come together to experience the Lord. The reason why this is Bethel, this reason why this is the house of God is the same reason why Jacob, where he was, was the house of God because God is here. <laughs> Woo! Well, there's an old saying, if that don't pull your trigger, I don't know what will. Or if, your wood, if you ain't burning, if your wood ain't on fire, it's because it is wet. The good news is, maybe you say, well, that doesn't excite me. You just hang around long enough. You hang around the fire. What do you do with wet wood that you plan on burning? You let it dry out. One of the quickest way, if you need it quickly, is place it around the fire so the heat will dry it out. You want to get uh, your wood, <laughs> you want to be on fire? Well, then hang around people that are on fire. That is the quickest way to catch on fire. You stick around here and that will pull your trigger. The Word of God will light you on fire and you will burn and men will watch. They will want to know, what is it that causes you to be different? It's because you are a house of God and where you are, God is living on the inside. Let's turn in our Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 13. Matthew 21, 13. And said unto them, it is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Jesus is speaking of a physical building. Jesus is speaking of a physical building, and so we know that we are the house of God, but we also know we can dedicate places, buildings, to being the house of God. So Jesus is talking about a building where people gather together. And David had it in his heart to build that temple where people could come together and experience God. And David was told that he couldn't build it, but Solomon would. But David gave a lot of resources and led people to do the same. Let's read about it in 1 Chronicles 29 and 3. And I just want to give props out to David here because David's heart could have been hurt so bad when he was told by the prophet that he couldn't build it, that it wasn't for him to build. He goes, well, I wanted to do it, so therefore he, I'm going to take all my toys and go home. But David decided, all right, if I can't build it, I'm going to fund it. I'm going to pay for it. Let's look at David. First Chronicles 29 and verse 3. 
Moreover, because I have set my affections to the house of God, I have of my own proper gold and of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the house uh, for the holy house. Now, David is stating here, I, what I normally give, what, I, what I've already planned on giving, I'm going to give it. But I'm going to give above and beyond what I've already planned. <laughs> I'm going to give more than what I should because I want to bless the house of God. Now, let's look at verse 5. The gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Now let's look at it in the Living Bible Translation. I believe it gives a little clearer uh, statement here. Who will give himself and all that he has to the Lord? That is a statement right there. Who will give himself and all that he has to the Lord? Who will allow the Lord to control everything that he has? That nothing is considered to be your own if God asks for it. That you would be so willing to give it, including your time, your finances, everything you have. Let's look at verse 6. And the chief, then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel, and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work, offered willingly. Let's jump to verse 9. Then the people rejoiced, for they offered willingly, because the perfect with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Now, let's look at verse 14 in the same chapter. Now, this is David, King David, praying. He's praying to the Lord. He rejoiced when the people gave, and now he's in a time of prayer. I, I, I love this. But who am I? Have you ever thought of that? Who am I? In all this, Father, who am I to receive your goodness? Who am I to receive your glory? Who am I in any of it? <laughs> all right, all right, let's look. Let's, we'll get into it. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own we've given thee. Now, I think the Good News translation opens this right up where you can understand it in uh, perfect English. Are you ready? Yet my people, this is David speaking again, pray. I think it's much clearer. Yet my people and I, cannot really give you anything because everything is a gift from you and we have only given back what is already yours. Kind of reminds me of uh, giving to my mom on Christmas and my dad. I remember as a little bitty boy, I wanted to give my mom and my dad something for Christmas and I didn't have anything. And I talked to my mom about it and uh, we came up with many plans and none of them were working. You know, you can make something. Well, I, I didn't want to just make something. I wanted to get them. I wanted to buy them something. I wanted them to have something they would like. I wanted to bless them. I wanted to give to them. They're so great to me and they still are. They still give way too much. Uh, and they are such a blessing. And I pray to the good Lord Jesus that you had or have parents like that to be able to know that kind of love and that just kind of giving. My parents overdo it all the time. My goodness, they are amazing. All right. But one Christmas, I wanted to give my parents something. I didn't have anything. And so I don't know how we got to this conclusion because it was so long ago. But I remember my mom. We finally came to the conclusion that she would give us money. And we would go buy her something from the family dollar or Dollar Tree or whatever it was. And that she would pay for it. That she would pay for it. But we would buy it for her and she wouldn't know what it is and we'd wrap it up. We would wrap it up and give it, you know, put it under the tree. She'd have it on Christmas. And I think about it now. And honestly, at the time that I gave it, 
I, it was such a big deal, and I was so happy and so pleased with what I picked out for them, and I just knew they were going to love it. And, like, I could take some type of credit that I gave this. I finally was able to give. But years later, I looked back at it like King David and said, how can I ever really give you anything? It came from you. You paid for it. Now, it, that is kind of ridiculous, but that's exactly what it was. David is saying, I give you gold but you made it. I give you silver, but you made it. We may offer things, we may finances, we may give even food and sacrifices, but what in this earth do we have that you didn't make? The only reason we're able to even give to the house of God is because God created it all. God created everything it is that we're using, everything that we have. And just like King David in verse 9, where he rejoiced after seeing the people give, I'm going to tell you, every member of our church, I rejoice. We have such a large number of volunteers, percent-wise. Percent-wise, the people who give, most people at our church give. Most people at our church tithe. Most of the people at our church, there's really nobody that comes to mind that attends here that I don't know that doesn't volunteer and give. And man, I am so thankful, so blessed as a pastor to be the pastor of this church. If you consider me your pastor, oh my goodness, how blessed I truly am. And what an honor it is to pastor our church, the letter R church. And that R stands for Redemption, Righteousness, Relationships. And the people here give. And their heart, and like David asked, who will concentrate, who will set themselves aside to be dedicated to the Lord? We're in the middle of a remodel project right now. Uh, and we're, we've redone the downstairs, the flooring, almost completely finished. We're, we're this close to being done. We'll be done by this weekend. Um, and Saturday... Last Saturday, a group of guys got together and some ladies and they came and we were cleaning, getting things ready. And I thought we would be done around 10 o'clock. I really did. Uh, some people had to leave just due to time schedules and I get that and understand that completely. But there was a group of people who stayed. Who stayed. Saturday, all night long, till 1.58 in the morning, Sunday morning. 1.58, we walked out of the building dumbfounding that they stuck around, dumbfounded that they stayed with me that whole time for the building of the house of God. Now, I didn't know if any of those guys would show up the next morning, or excuse me, <laughs> the next morning. In a couple hours, every one of them did. The members of our church, I believe, are some of the best members on the face of the earth of any church. Dedicated. Have absolutely said, Lord, everything I got is yours. Their heart is where it needs to be. And it is an honor and a privilege. And I rejoice like King David in the fact that the people want to give not only their time, their finances, their resources, but everything they are, their praise, their worship, they give it in the house of God to the Lord. And it is amazing to watch such wonderful people follow the plan of God for their life. Now let's look, same chapter, verse 18. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever. What is David talking about? What is, what is he asking the Lord to keep forever? King David, what is he talking about? He's talking about the people being sold out to the Lord. That giving the Lord their everything, above and beyond their tithe, above and beyond their giving. They, they sold everything into it to build the house of the Lord. He is saying, King David is saying, Keep this in your people. May this never leave your people. May your people always have the heart to build the house of God. Now, in the imaginations of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. All right, 
I am looking, I got to wrap this up. I've taken way too much time today. Uh, number one, God is a builder. Number two, God is building his house. And number three, God is building your house. King David tells the prophet of God, I want to build a house for the Lord. Now the prophet goes ahead and tells King David, do it, do it. Now the prophet goes and spends time with the Lord in prayer and God corrects him and says, David's not to build it. Solomon's going to build it. So the uh, prophet comes back to David and says, King, uh, you can't build it. It's actually going to be Solomon who builds it. And in First uh, Chronicles 17 and 10, uh, the prophet begins to list the things God is going to do because of the heart of David. And heart is everything, my friend. The, your, your, your why behind your what is everything. Are you under the law doing the work because the Bible tells us this is what we should do? Are you doing the work because it is who you are and it's your relationship with God and you're changing into the image of Christ every day? You're spending time meditating on the Word of God and you're changing. You are literally changing. No longer are you doing things because you feel you have to. You're doing them because it's who you are. 1 Chronicles 17 and 10. Furthermore, I tell thee that the Lord will build thee a house. Now, in verse 25, King David responds to God wanting to build him a house. Verse 25, so God tells David, I'm going to build you a house because of your heart. The re you, you being who I created you to be, I'm going to build you a house. And David responds in verse 25, For thou, O my God, hast told thy servants that thou wilt build him a house. Therefore, thy servant has found in his heart to pray before thee. This is what I want us to do. I know I've gone a little long today, but this is what I want you to do right where you are. We do this almost every Sunday. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you trying to tell me? In this message, what are you speaking to my heart? What are you telling me, Holy Spirit? Now, listen here. I don't want you to listen to the voice of the enemy. If it's condemning, if it brings up every time you've missed the mark, every time you haven't given when you should have, time, finances, money, whatever it is, don't pay attention. That is not the voice of the Lord. Now, God will bring correction, but not condemnation. God will lift you up. God will encourage you. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit. He is going to lift you up, encourage you. There may be correction, but it's going to be encouraging. It's going to be uplifting. Let's take a moment and hear from the Lord. Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to our hearts? I believe the Lord is going to speak to you. I believe the Holy Spirit, you are the house of God carrying the Lord around with you and His sheep knows His voice. You'll hear it and you'll know it. You may say, I've never heard the voice of God. You may say, I'm not even in a house of God yet. I don't even know how to become the house of God. The Bible tells us if we would confess Jesus as our Savior, believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. Maybe like the prodigal son, you've done that before. You've, you've come into the house of God, but like the prodigal son, you walked away from the plan of God, from the house of your father. My friend, the beauty of the story of the prodigal son is it doesn't end with the son leaving. It ends with the father seeing the son. The son comes to his right mind and comes home. And the father runs to him, throws a party for him. That's where the story ends. So whether you need to confess Jesus for the first time of your life, or you re need to rededicate your life to the Lord. Today is your day. Either way, let's say this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, we confess Jesus is the Son of God. We believe in our heart. So we know today that we are saved, that we are houses of God that we are your children. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've rededicated your life, or that's the first time you prayed it, please get a hold of us, let us know. I just want to remind you that our church is a non-denominational church that meets in Madison, Wisconsin, and we would love to have you a part. If you're in southern Wisconsin, come and visit us. If you're too far out, continue to meet us online. If I wasn't saved, do you know what I would do? 
get saved. This is the only life to live. My friend, until I see you again in person or online, I look forward to seeing you next week.